difference between a checking account and a savings account. Savings accounts are meant for saving money, and so banks don't want you to be putting money out, like making a bunch of transactions. Um, as a matter of fact, there are federal limits to the number of transactions that can be taken out of a, check, a savings account on a month. A checking account, however, is meant for fluid money, for money to be going in and out. Okay, um, It allows you to deposit, withdraw, and make transfers. Most checking accounts do not have a limit on the number of transfers or transactions you can have in a month. Some checking accounts do but they're rarer. Most of them have are unlimited transactions. The check, which most people probably don't use a lot of checks anymore, um, but the check was at you know before the age of computers the, the only common way to to pay money over long distances or to send and pay a bill or to give somebody make money if you didn't have cash. Um, they used to be very common. People would go to the grocery store, write a check. People would, you know, you want to give somebody birthday money, write a check. You know, they used to be very common. Now they're not so common anymore. But a check was actu is actually, it is a written order to the bank. Um, and it's telling the bank, I've written this check for this amount of money. Give this amount of money to the person on that line right there. And you sign it, and it's, it's a legal document. It's a written order. Most payments and things today are done through an electronic funds transfer instead of a check, and that is an electronic order. So basically it is an electronic check. And it's telling you to, uh, the bank to pay money out of your account. Um, common things are bill pay. If you go online and pay your bill using your bank account, you know, your check checking account and routing number, um, PayPal, if you're transferring money to someone else's account, if you use your card as a debit card. But not Visa or, um, or MasterCard or whatever. Okay, so if you have to put in your PIN number, it's an electronic funds transfer. If you use it as a Visa and you actually sign your name, it's not actually an electronic funds transfer, it's processed differently. Um, the payee is the person or business that gets the money, and the drawer is the person that owns the account and is paying the money. So whenever you go to the store and, and buy a pack of gum, the 7-Eleven is the payee, and you're the drawer. Uh, your check clears, or your payment clears, your electronic payment clears, when the money has actually left your account and gone into the other person's account. Until then, it's pending. Um, knowing how long this takes is very important. Um, if you know when you pay, for example, like maybe your electric bill, and you do it electronically, and you see that it takes about three days to clear your account, you need to know that when you pay your electric bill, you can't assume that the balance in your account, if you go look online or whatever, is good until after that payment has cleared. Okay. Um, deposit slips. You used to have to use a deposit slip at the ATM as well, but now you don't really have to do that anymore. And even some banks don't require them if you go inside, um, but then some banks do. So a deposit slip is a piece of paper that is filled out and you use them to make in-person deposits at the bank. Um, they have your, the date, your account number, your name, and the amount of the deposit on it. And it helps because when, um, when you go to the bank teller, they have you know, their one drawer and everybody's deposits goes into the same drawer. And then the deposit slips are used during the reconciliation process. I mean, she, the teller, he or she will type it into your account at that time when you make the deposit. But if something goes wrong and that information doesn't save, 
their drawer gets reconciled at the end of the night and if there's money in there that's not accounted for they look back through the deposit slips to make sure that all the cash or checks go into the account that they were meant to go into so it's like a backup system for balancing the books of the bank at the end of the night um, direct deposit is automatically depositing money into your account and it's an electronic deposit and it's a paycheck or a tax return. Um, I can't direct deposit money into anybody's account because I'm not an entity. It has to be like a business or a government set up thing. So usually it's, it's just government checks or paychecks. A hold is when you make a deposit and the bank does not allow the funds to be available yet. There are a couple reasons this can happen. Uh, the most common is an out-of-state check. So if, you know, like your grandma lives in Idaho and she sends you a check in the mail and then you go deposit it because it's an out-of-state check, they put a three-day hold usually on it, three to seven day. Um, basically what they're doing is they're making sure that the money comes from that other bank before they give it to you. They don't want to give you the money and then it never came. Um, holds can be put on some direct deposits as well or holds can be put on really large amounts. Um, just personally I had to deposit an insurance check one time that I got that was for a couple thousand dollars and the bank put a hold on it because it was such a large amount and so they had a rule that any amount over I don't remember the exact line but let's say five thousand dollars if there was a check you were depositing or any deposit over that much they put a 10-day hold on it automatically just to make sure that it all cleared and all the money ended up in your account before you had access to it um, and they'll tell you in your bank paperwork how long of holds and what for. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, endorsing. Whenever you deposit an actual physical check, so here's the check, you know, all the information is on the front of the check. You flip the check over, there's a place to sign. You want to sign it and you want to write your account number on it if you're depositing it. If you're just cashing it, you can just sign it, but if you're depositing it, you want your account number on there. Again, because if something should come up, and that money didn't show up in your account, they can look at the checks and say, oh, this one was supposed to go into this account number here. If you don't sign your check and you make a deposit, say, at the ATM, this has happened to me, I didn't sign the back of the check, and I deposited it in the ATM, and the bank went to process it and went, oh, that's not signed, and so they stuck it in an envelope, and they mailed it back to me, and the money never went into my account until later when I got the check in the mail and then I signed it and I went back to the bank. So there was like a five day delay on that money being available because I forgot to sign the back. Some banks are not as picky as that, but legally they're not supposed to process the check unless you signed the back of it. So just make sure you always sign the back of a check if you're depositing or cashing. Well, if you're cashing it, you have to sign it because you're right there in front of them and they'll hand it back to you. But if you're depositing it, just make sure you signed it. And I recommend always putting your account number on there as well because that guarantees that you have proof that it was meant to go into which account and you know, things like that. So that's endorsing. Any questions on those? Um, once a check is cleared, so the money has been paid, it becomes canceled. Okay, checks are numbered sequentially, and that's why if you order checks, has anybody ever used a check in here? Yeah, like written a check? Okay, I don't use a lot of checks. However, my mortgage has to be paid with a check um, because they don't accept electronic. So I have to mail them a check. Um, I pay a check for uh, my son's insurance because to process it online costs five dollars extra. To mail a check costs me forty cents or whatever the stamp is, right? So forty cents, five dollars. I'll just send them a check. You know. So I, I actually end up writing about three checks every month. 
for that reason. Um, everything else I do, like through bill pay or online, but you know, if you write checks, and checks are a good thing to have, um, you know, like a lot of people, the only check they ever write in a month is to pay their rent to their apartment complex because you can write the check in and drop it in a box, you know? So there's, they're good to have. When you order checks, they're numbered and they're numbered sequentially. And the reason they're numbered sequentially is because once I've written check 250 and it's canceled, I can never write check 250 again. It'll flag my account for fraud because 250 has already happened. Now, if I get a different bank account at a different bank, I could write a different check 250, but on this one account, that's it. Check 250 is canceled. It cannot be used again. Um, so that's why checks are numbered. Um, insufficient funds occur when you try to process transactions and there's not enough money in your account. And we're going to talk about the reasons that N NSFs happen and how to protect yourself against them. <coughs> um, not right this second though, but this can be checks, debit, transactions, any kind of transaction, and you'll have one of two things happen. You have an insufficient funds in your account, so it will either bounce, in which case the payment is rejected. So I write a check, there's not enough money in the account, they bounce it, and so now the people I wrote the check to didn't get paid, so they're going to come after me. Or it's overdrafted. And when that happens, the bank goes ahead and pays it and makes your account negative because you didn't have enough money in the account. So now your account's negative. In either case, whether they bounce it or pay it, you get charged a fee. Now, if they bounce it, you get charged a fee from them and you get charged a fee from the person that the check bounced to. Minimum of $25 each. Some banks it's even $35 or $40. But you're looking at a minimum of $50 if the check gets bounced. Yes. If I write a check and it bounces, my bank is going to charge me a fee and the person that I paid the check to that now has not been paid is going to charge me a fee. And they're a minimum of $25 each. Minimum. So it's a minimum of $50 that, that bounce check just cost me. Okay. And if the bank overdrafts it, let's say I write a check for $100, but I only had $50 in the account. But they go ahead and pay it because they're being, I have, you know, they're overdrafting it. And it's called an overdraft because it's over the amount of money that you've had in your account. So now they paid a $100 check, but I only had $50. They're going to pay it, which makes my account now negative 50. And they're going to charge me a fee a minimum of $25. Now my account is a minimum of $75 negative. And then some banks charge what they call extended overdraft fees, which means after a period of like a week or so, they start charging you a daily overdraft fee. Every single day it's negative, they charge another fee. It's not as high as the initial 25 or whatever, but it's usually about $5 a day. That adds up fast. You're talking $35 a week if it's $5 a day. That your bank just keeps going negative and negative and negative. It's very hard to recover from these things. Now, one way that you can prevent this is to have overdraft protection. Overdraft protection is when you tie your checking account to a savings account that has money in it or a credit line, so like a, a credit card. Then the bank says, oh, you don't have enough money, so they'll take the money from the credit card or the savings account to pay the thing. Now, let's say you had $50 in your account, you wrote a $100 check. They'll take $50 more out of your savings account, plus however much the fee is, which is usually way less than an overdraft fee. So like maybe $10 or $15. They'll take that out of the savings account too. They'll pay everything and now you have a zero balance, but you're not negative. And it only costs you like a $10 fee instead of like a $30 fee. Does that make sense? So overdraft protection is one of the things that you can put on your account to protect you from that negative situation happening. Yeah. Um, what would you say your order type is one of them? Um, oh, so if, oh, NSF, I forgot to put this. This is called NSF is what it'll show up on your account. Um, so if, 
Yeah, on your bank statement, it'll show up as an NSF for insufficient funds. Um, so, it, that's, so this is if you have overdraft protection, if you have insufficient funds, then the bank pays the transactions out of your savings account or off of your credit line, pays the difference, and then they charge you a small fee, which also gets charged to the checking or the savings account or the credit line. So your bank account at that point would be zero, but it wouldn't be negative. Let's say I wrote a check for $100. I only had 50 in my account. And then I forgot I wrote a check for $100, and I thought I had $50, and I go to the store, and I go to, or I go to the mall, and I go to one store, and I spend $5. And then I go to Chick-fil-A, and I get an iced tea, so I spend like 3 bucks. And then I go to another store, and I spend $15. And I'm like, ah, that's fine. I had $50 in my account. Now what will happen? What happens if the check hits first? I get an NSF fee for that check. And then those three transactions that were under $10 each hit. I'll get an NSF fee for all three transactions. If that's $25 each, that's $75 more dollars that I'm now paying for that drink from Chick-fil-A and the two little cheapy things I bought at the mall. So, like, really, you want to keep very careful track because the way things hit your account, like, if the, the three little transactions hit first and then the check, you only have the one fee. But if that check hits first and then those three transactions, you're going to have four fees. And you have no way of knowing how things are going to hit your account. So, you just, this, these are things you want to be really careful about. And, like I said, we're going to talk about tools and things to help you not have this happen. Um, maintenance fees are monthly fees that are charged to maintain your account. And you can, a lot of banks have free accounts that have no maintenance fee or only have, you know, certain restrictions for maintenance fees. So like um, if your balance falls below a certain amount, Okay, but for example, my bank account, my checking account and savings account have no monthly fees. So you don't have to worry about it. But if your bank does have maintenance fees, you really don't want to forget to account for them. Because if you have a $10 a month fee, let's just say hypothetically, and you forget to account for that $10, then you think you have $10 more than you have then you can bounce a check. Or if you forget to account for it months and months and months in a row, you would think you had like 50 or 60 or $70 more than you had because you forgot to withdraw all those $10. So just if you have monthly fees, don't forget about them. They're really important. Um, interest is paid on balance in your account. Um, very few checking accounts pay interest. And those that do have high minimum balances. So if you have a checking account that pays interest, usually they only pay interest if you have like a, a minimum balance of $1,000 every day. So like there would be that $1,000 sitting in your account that you're not ever allowed to touch. Okay. Basic checking account is the most common. Um, they usually have low or no monthly fees. They usually have no or low minimum balance. They don't pay interest, and they have very few transaction limits. Um, interest bearing and checking accounts do pay interest, But again, they generally have high monthly minimum balance. I mean, generally have high minimum balances. Okay, free.
free checking accounts. <clears throat> um, this is protected by law. Okay, it's um, there's the law called the Federal Truth and Savings Act. Savings. If the bank says it's free. There can be no monthly fees. Okay. Now, they can still charge you fees for things like going overdraft. Right? They can charge those kind of fees because that's a fee, that's a penalty for something that you did, but they cannot charge you a monthly fee. If they say the account is free, they cannot, they have to follow this or you can report them and they'll be penalized by the law. So no monthly fees, no minimum balance. Okay, that's the requirement by the federal law. But a joint checking account is an account you have with another person. So if you and your significant other open a bank account together, you're both on it. You both have equal access to the money and equal liability for any kind of overdrafts or anything like that. You can't, you know, go to the bank and be like, I didn't overdraft the account, he did. Make him pay it. It doesn't work that way. You're equally responsible. But you also have equal rights to the money. So you can't be like, well, no, that was my check that was deposited. He can't touch that $5. He can only touch his $5. You know, you can't, it's equal. Okay. Um, express checking accounts is another type of um, checking account where you can't go to the bank. Um, these are becoming less common, but when electronic banking first started, there was like this thing, banks were trying to encourage people not to come in. And so with an express checking account, you can use the ATM, you can use the phone, like the automated phone, or you can use the computer. If you talked to a real person at the bank, you got charged a fee. And they still exist, so you don't want one. Because, you know, sometimes you need to go talk to a real person. You don't want to pay a fee because you talk to a person at the bank. You know what I mean? Uh, and that was on the phone or if you went in in person. Um, then you have NOW accounts, and NOW stands for Negotiable Order of Withdrawal. They are free checking accounts that have interest attached to them and to be honest with you I don't know a ton about now accounts um, but I do believe they have minimum balance requirements and things like that and those requirements would vary from bank to bank um, but they are a free account with interest and then you have lifeline checking accounts which um, have you guys heard about like lifeline cell phones and lifeline electricity and things like that Okay, Lifeline is um, state by state programs for low income individuals. So like a Lifeline cell phone gives you free 300 minutes. So you have like some way to, you know, so your kid's school can call you and things like that for emergencies. Um, and then a Lifeline checking account is for low income people where there's no monthly maintenance fees, like no minimum balance, and then any fees that get charged for other things like NSF or stuff are much lower on those accounts because of the state supplementing for the, the low income. So if you, if you have low income, you can qualify for a Lifeline account and many states require banks to offer them by law. Okay. And then a single account is an account with just the one person on it. So like if you own your own bank account and nobody else's name is on it, it's a single account. Okay. Um, check register. That is where you keep track of your transactions. So this, um, I'm just going to put running list of transactions and balance. Debits is money coming out of the account. Okay, so you subtract these. Credits are money going into the account, so you add these.
looks like. Um, if you go into the bank, you have to handwrite in your own account number. If you get a checkbook, there's deposit slips on the back of the pad of checks, and they'll have the account number printed on there for you. Okay. Um, also, on the back of a deposit slip, if you flip it over, they will have more lines like this in case you're depositing more than this number of checks. So it's like if you, for example, like you're a business and you bring in a bunch of checks because people gave you paid for something with checks, you can list them on the back. So what we do is we take our date, which today is the 18th, and I put the name, which is Allison, and I don't know her last name, so she's Allison Doe, and her account number, okay, those get filled out. Um, her balance, I'm just going to write down here so that we have it out of the problem, is 2300 She's depositing a paycheck for four twenty-five thirty-three. Sorry. Four twenty-five thirty-three, and ideally the bank would like you to list the number of the check here. Um, a twenty-dollar rebate check, and whatever the check number is there, and a personal check. Okay, for five hundred fifty. She wants to receive two hundred in cash, so that goes right here on the less cash. Less means your deposit is less that amount because they're going to give you back that cash. Also, usually, if you're getting cash back, you have to sign your thing somewhere. So she signs it. Okay, so we subtotal everything up. So we have 5, 9, 995.33 is the subtotal. Then we subtract the cash she's going to get $200 back. So her total deposit is $795.33. So these are being added, and this gets subtracted. Now her balance was $2,300. She has added now $795 to that. So her new balance is $3095. Item number, keep track of the check number. That's important because when you get your check statement, if you actually write checks, <coughs> um, check fraud most frequently occurs because you mail a check, somebody intercepts it, and then they use like whatever chemicals to take the ink off of the check from the pen you wrote with and then put new information like their name in there and a new amount. That's how check fraud most frequently occurs, check fraud. And so you want to know that check 3271 was written to DeWitt's auto body, and you want that written down so that if check 3271 shows up as maybe even the same amount, because they're trying not to trigger it, but so it'll be 1721, but it shows up as to, you know, Joe Smith. You know, I didn't write that check to Joe Smith. I wrote it to DeWitt's auto body. This is fraud, you know, that kind of thing. So you want it. Catch me if you can. Yes, that's exactly how he did it. Yeah. So you want, you definitely want to keep track of the check number. As far as the other things, I write D's for deposit, and I write, if I use my debit card, I write a V for Visa because I have a Visa debit card. And if I do like an online payment or a bill pay or something, I just do like an E or, or a V. So I know that it was electronic. So that, as far as the other codes go, it's the code that makes sense to you that you want to keep track of, like, so that you know what it was. Then you definitely want to do the date, because that helps you keep track of where you are in the process. And you can also see how long things take to clear. Then you write who it was for. You don't have to write this to the side, car repair. This is like notes to yourself. If you want to keep track of that, you can. You can use, see how there's like a two line? If you look in yours, you've got a white and a gray. You can keep each line individual, or you can use the white and the gray 
for one transaction, that's up to you also how you want to organize this. Um, payments or debits, this gets subtracted and deposits or credit get added. These columns here you won't have in the little checkbook I gave you, but fee is like if you go to the ATM and you go to a different bank's ATM, you know how you get charged a fee for using their ATM? Yeah, so you'd say, okay, I withdrew $20 and then there was a $1.50 fee or whatever. You know, you put that right there. Or you could just put $21.50 here. You know, it's up to you how you do that kind of thing. Um, but that's what that column is for in a full size check register. Again, you don't have that column in here. And then the check mark column, this is for balancing, which we will do in a later section. So for right now, okay, we started with a, an initial balance of 3,672.27, and we wrote a check to the auto repair place for 17.21, and that gives us uh, 1,951.27. Anybody want to check my math with the calculator? And then we write Kate's guitar hut strings of negative 3250. How was my math? Okay. Subtract 3250. We get 1918.77. And then we have a deposit, so we're going to add that. Now see how I'm doing minus, minus, and plus? That's what I would do in this column here on the small register, the amount of payment or withdrawal. I just do pluses and minuses all the way down so I know which numbers to add and which numbers to subtract. If I don't, because I don't always, like if I'm at the store or something, I'll write in the amount, but I don't always do the math right then. So I could end up with two or three transactions listed here that I go back and do the math later. So I need to know whether or not to add or subtract. Okay, so plus 821.53, so 27.40, was that 30 or 03? 30. And then minus 101.50, so 26.38.80. And you do want to do a total on every single line, not just a grand total at the bottom, because if you make a mistake, you want to be able to find out where it was so you can fix it. Oops, lost again, 249990. Okay, and that's your current balance in your account. Any questions on that?